Hello and welcome. You're watching the Inside Story. I'm Nabila Jamal. This edition, we're here to talk to you about the hijab, all the controversies surrounding the hijab. In fact, the headscarf worn by Muslim women to cover their modesty is today in the center of a storm, a debate, a controversy that's now panned the world over. This has happened due to the death of a 22-year-old Iranian woman who was in custody. She was detained by the moral police for inappropriate hijab, basically not wearing the hijab in the right manner. Her death has now sparked protests across Iran and the Iranian regime is busy proving it as an international propaganda, basically an international plot to topple their regime. Here's a quick report that really explains what's happening in Iran today. We came to Iran to prepare the situation for toppling the Islamic regime. On 6th October, Iran published a video showing two detained French citizens accused of spying. Tehran tried to describe the ongoing anti-hijab protests in Iran as a foreign plot instead of local anger over the death of a 22-year-old detained by the country's morality police. Four days before the video was published, speakers at Iran's parliament warned that protests over Masa Amini's death could turn into a challenge against the ruling establishment. They urged security forces to deal with it harshly. The enemy was ready to lift a large portion of the sanctions, but the protest encouraged it to increase pressure on the Iranian people, like what happened in 2009. That encouraged the enemy to impose extensive sanctions against us while it was agreeing a deal with Iran. This dramatic video is from a girls' high school in Karaja. In this city, in the west of Iranian capital of Tehran, most of the girls are without their mandatory hijab or headscarf. They're seen screaming at an unidentified man and throwing objects at him as he hurriedly leaves the scene. This Monday protest became instantly a viral video of the anti-hijab protest in Iran. A day later, another video spread on social media showing Iranian schoolgirls, some of them without their mandatory headscarves, heckling what appears to be an official invited to address them. The girls chant at the man standing on a podium in what appears to be a schoolyard. Busage is Iran's paramilitary force, widely used in cracking down on protesters. Busage members and other officials are often invited to schools to lecture about morality, about religion or the Islamic revolution. Reports on social media suggested that the event took place in Iran's fifth most populous city of Shiraz. But Iran's president blamed America and Israel for planning these protests in the country to stop Iran's progress. Why did the enemies, why did America and the Zionist regime conspire against our nation, our country? and our revolution and create these riots. As the Supreme Leader said, our country is advancing and the enemies don't want our country to make progress. Protests have embroiled dozens of cities across Iran and evolved into the most widespread challenge to Iran's leadership in years. These protests have stretched into a third week, even after authorities disrupted the internet and deployed riot troops. But women and even men came out in protests, burning hijabs, cutting off hair, chanting death to the dictator. The full breadth of the demonstrations and crackdown remains unclear. An associated press tally of reports in state-run and state-linked media shows that there have been at least 1,900 arrests connected to these anti-hijab protests. Demonstrations have been reported in at least 50 cities, towns and villages. Iranian state television suggested at least 41 people had been killed in the demonstrations as of 24th September alone. There is an Oslo-based group called Iran Human Rights estimates at least 154 people have been killed. The woman being dragged.
dragged is 22-year-old Mehsa Amin. Her fault, so-called inappropriate hijab. Ms. Amini, a 22-year-old Iranian woman from the Kurdish minority, was with her brother in Tehran when she was arrested on the 13th of September for what was perceived to be improper hijab. She fell into a coma shortly after collapsing at Bozara Detention Center. Ms. Amini, who also goes by the Kurdish name Gina, died three days later. There are reports that Ms. Amini was beaten on the head with a baton and her head was banged against the vehicle by so-called morality police. Authorities have stated that she died of natural causes. Mehsa Amini's Kurdish name, Gina, means mind, and she had a mind of her own. Following the strict rules of Iranian moral police, she was wearing a hijab and was in a public place in her brother's company. But that wasn't enough. Tehran of 2022 found her hijab offensive because her hair was showing. She was dragged and beaten up. Her brother, Kiarash, intervened. However, the police told him that they are taking his sister to the police station for one hour of re-education. Her brother waited outside the police station for her to be released. But an ambulance pulled up and took his sister to the hospital. The police claimed she suffered a heart attack. But her family countered the claim by saying she had no history of heart diseases. Masa's death became a spark for this protest movement across Iran and Kurdistan. The Iranian authorities are pressuring her parents not to release information to the media and the world. Mehsa's father was angry and defiant. He refused to allow Islamic prayers over his daughter's dead body. Masa is the voice of the anger of the Iranian people right now. Masa has sparked this anger. Why? Because when Masa died, the Islamic Republic tried to bury her secretly at night, without anyone knowing. Fortunately, the people in her hometown of Sarkis prevented this plot and did not allow this. With the help of thousands of people from Sarkis and other cities, she was buried. Masa's death has sparked anti-hijab protests that's not only burning in Iran, but across the world it has found voice of support among celebrities and women in general. Here's a quick look, a report that really explains how the anti-hijab protests are now spreading like wildfire across the globe. Bollywood celebrity Priyanka Chopra posted her support for the anti-hijab protests on the 6th of October. Within hours, it had close to 4 lakh likes and nearly 40,000 comments. Iranian actor of Bollywood, Mandana Karimi, staged a lone protest in Mumbai in solidarity with the women of Iran for their right to wail or unwail. French actresses, singers, songwriters took to social media and cut off their hair to show their support for the protests raging in Iran. Belgium's foreign minister and two other lawmakers cut their hair in parliament in solidarity with anti-government demonstrations in Iran. Voor vrouw, voor vrijheid, voor het leven. Until the women of Iran. On 5th October, a Swedish member of the European Parliament, Abir Al Sahelani, cut her hair during a speech in the EU Assembly to show solidarity with Iranian women. These protests are not limited to only celebrities. Women across the world from Ecuador to Italy cut off their hair to join the growing voice of protest against moral policing surrounding hijab in Iran. These tourists also joined the protests in Rome.
I decided to cut my hair because I cannot believe that in 2022 we are still, the women are still struggling for to have their basic freedom and basic rights. I cannot believe that we are still uh, going through what we are going through, especially in Iran. So I am with the women of Iran. They need to know that they're not alone. They need to know that what they're asking, which are basic human rights, uh, is something that we want to fight alongside with them. These protests have also been discussed at the United Nations. We call on the authorities to respect uh, the rights and freedom of expression, peaceful assembly and association. And we also call on the authorities to respect women's rights uh, and to take further steps to eliminate forms of discrimination against women and girls and implement effective measures uh, to protect them uh, from their uh, human rights violations in accordance with international standards. Making the voice stronger, Iranian women living abroad have urged the world to come together. For the Islamic Republic, hijab is a tool to control women and through women to control the whole society. For, for them, compulsory hijab is like, uh, like, like the Berlin Wall. If we tear this wall down, the Islamic Republic won't exist because it's the main pillar of the Islamic Republic. Women in Iran are not stopping, and as more and more women join in protest, the cry for women's right to wail or unveil is becoming a universal call. Now, there are different forms of headscarf, different types of cloaks worn by Muslim women. Hijab is one of them. The terms and forms differ, but the main purpose of them is to cover a woman's modesty, their sexuality, in the name of faith. But here the question is, does it really ignore a woman's right to wail or unwail? Listen in. The terms may be used interchangeably, but in fact the hijab, niqab and burqa are different pieces of Islamic covering. They are all designed to protect a woman's modesty. In recent years, they have sparked debate around the world, with some militating against this show of religious identity and others seeing it as a patriarchal imposition on women's bodies, cloaking them in victimhood and depriving them of choice. The Muslim woman herself is divided, with one half of the sorority discarding it and the other half embracing it as an observation of their faith. But first, what is the hijab and its cousins? The hijab is the simplest covering. This is essentially a length of cloth used to cover the head and neck, much like the ghungat among Hindu women, who often use the end of the sari to cover the head. A niqab is a starker covering. It veils the face and covers the head and neck, but leaves the eyes exposed. The burqa is the most intense covering. It includes a full body cloak, a veil for the face and a covering for the head, as well as screen covering the eyes. A chadar is a large piece of cloth that is used as a combination shawl covering head and face. These are only some variations. Others include the shaila, a long scarf that is used to cover the head and face, and the abaya, which is a long robe-like dress that's usually worn over the clothing. While it is common to see such clothing in black, the color is not fixed. For instance, in Afghanistan, burqas are often made in the shade of blue. The exact cut and style also vary, keeping in mind local customs and climate. In India, hijab is brewed in a very different controversy. The Apex Court is now hearing a case about women's right to wear a hijab. And this is a story that's been in the headlines right from the start of this year, all because the Karnataka government decided that they wanted to ban hijab from educational institutions. Now, let's take a quick look at what really is happening in Karnataka and how this is echoed in different parts of India. 
In the past, a couple of Indian women have lodged their protest against the hijab law in Iran. A shooter, Hina Sidhu, and chess grandmaster, Swamya Swaminathan, both have boycotted tournaments in Iran to protest against the regressive law. In 2016, Hina Sidhu pulled out of the Asian Air Gun Shooting Championship, which was held in Tehran. She clarified her decision in a social media post where she said that to wear a hijab is not in the spirit of a sport. Chess Grandmaster Soumya Swaminathan decided to pull out of the Indian squad for the Asian Team Chess Championship held in Tehran in 2018. In a statement on Facebook, she wrote, and I quote, I find the Iranian law of compulsory headscarf to be in direct violation of my basic human rights, including my right to freedom of expression and right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. In India, hijab has been in the spotlight since the beginning of 2022. It started small. Six girls in their mid-teens in the coastal Karnataka town of Udupi were refused permission by their pre-university college to don the hijab in class. Twenty twenty two started with this protest. On January first, six girls entered the classrooms wearing headscarves, but an UDP pre university college denied them entry. The girls claimed wearing a hijab is their fundamental right. The school shared photographs and said no such precedence existed in the institution. The Basavaraj Bombay government in the state formed an expert committee to resolve the issue. By the end of month, the girls moved the Karnataka High Court claiming their right to wear the hijab. In the next few days, the showdown over hijab spreads. After UDP, hijab ban is reported in Shimoga. Now counter-protests erupt in UDP. Soon they spread across Karnataka. Hindu students demand entry with saffron shawls. On February 4th, the Karnataka government intervened and released an order mandating uniform rule. The High Court begins hearing on the petition filed by the girls on February 8th. While the matter is in court, protests spread across the state leading to a face-off between students. The hijab showdown reaches boiling point. On the one side, students wearing saffron scarves, on the other, girls in hijab in burqa. By the second week, the High Court forms a three-judge bench that hears the matter. On February 10th, the bench comprising Chief Justice of Karnataka High Court, Ritu Rajavasti, Justice Krishna S. Dixit and Justice J.M. Kazi stated that colleges in Karnataka can reopen but restrain students of colleges that have prescribed a dress code on uniform from wearing religious garments. Following the interim order, schools and colleges in the state were opened in a phased manner. All colleges were reopened on the 16th of February. Panic gripped the coastal state as more colleges reported 10 situations. Students with headscarves or burqa are banned from entry and protests break out at the gates. During the hearing, the PU College, the epicenter of Karnataka hijab row, blamed a radical group for allegedly spearheading the fight for hijab. While the petitioner's advocates said 
such a ban is illegal and asked how a statutory ban can be made the guardian of fundamental rights. Finally, on March 15th, the Karnataka High Court pronounced its judgment in the hijab case. The court upheld the government's order, dismissed petitions challenging the ban on hijab in educational institutes. The court stated, hijab is not an essential religious practice in Islam and freedom of religion under Article 25 of the Constitution is subject to reasonable restrictions. In June this year, 24 girls were suspended for wearing the hijab in the classroom at a Mangalore college. They returned to class after a week by tendering an apology letter to the principal, stating that they would comply with the college uniform rules. The Karnataka hijab ban in educational institutions is now being heard in the apex court. On 21st September, the Supreme Court observed that allowing girl students to wear hijab to educational institutions may also be viewed as an opportunity for children at an impressionable age to learn about diversity that India is all about. The court has reserved its verdict in the case. The question comes as in India where there are women who are saying it is their decision that they have a constitutional right if they choose to wear the hijab. So how do you decide if a hijab is being worn by a woman by force or choice? Are you saying there is no choice that they have? It's, it cannot be a choice. You know, normally the men ask women to wear hijab. Men, they don't wear hijab. Mm -hmm. It is women they have to wear hijab. Most women, you know, they, they're forced by their parents because, oh, and some women are, you know, they're afraid. If, they're no, if they do not wear hijab, they will, be, they will be beaten up. They will be, you know, they will be harassed by men. Mm -hmm. So they wear hijab. Hijab or a veil is and should be a woman's personal choice. In 2022, it can't possibly be enforced or dictated. Hijab or no hijab is not a political issue. It's entirely a personal one. It's essentially a woman's personal decision. As the anti-hijab protests in Iran and across the world gain momentum, in India, it's now become a political tool that needs arbitration from the apex court. That's all we have for now. Time for this episode of Inside Story. A short break. News and updates continue on the other side. Stay tuned to India Today.